So hi everyone, uh, as Anna said, my name is Aya and I'm the president of the Lebanese Society. I was asked here to maybe give a bit of context on everything that's going on in Lebanon. So uh, I was on the 4th of August at 6.08, uh, our lives as the Lebanese people changed forever. Uh, on that day at 6.08, a huge amount of ammonium nitrate stored at the Beirut port exploded, causing over 200 deaths, uh, 7,000 injuries, and over 300 people were left homeless. However, the crisis in Lebanon didn't really start on the 4th of August. The crisis started over 30 years ago. So for the past 30 years, Lebanon has been stained with conflicts, political feuds, wars, disasters, leaving its people in a state of distress. Back in October 2019, the Thawra, which means revolution in Arabic, started. People went to the street to denounce a corrupted government, skyrocketing unemployment rates, the devaluation of the Lebanese pound, a slacking health system, and the increasing wealth of the political figures, uh, while the state of the country and its people was plummeting. Lebanon, to me and to a lot of people who visited, is one of the most beautifully sculpted and diverse places in the world, but it was always disrupted by conflict. The 4th of August, however, was the breaking point. What is there left after your capital blows up? What is there left after you're obliged to call your loved ones to make sure they're alive? What is left after your house, your own comfort zone blows up? And what is left after you get the news that your friend died because of an event that's out of your control? The answer to, that, to these questions is all you have left are your people and art. The Thawra was designed through music, uh, paintings, creative slogans, sculpting, some created clothes, other created poetry. International artists like Sheb Khalid, Masari, wrote songs about Beirut. The rubbles and broken walls were transformed into masterpieces. And the pro protesters answered the violence by dancing and making music. Art is therapeutic for Lebanon. And it's a way to remind the people that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I am not a professional on the advantages of using art. And I'm sure Mrs. Proctor will teach us more about that. But I can tell you from my perspective as a Lebanese woman, I can assure that art has made our horrible situation even 1% better. Thank you so much for that, Aya. So I was uh, very pleased when Rebecca agreed to do this talk today for the sake of awareness and productive discussion. Rebecca has a true wealth of experience in the area of arts and culture and a particular ability to explain with exceptional clarity the intersection between art and politics. She is the former editor of Harper's Bazaar Interiors and Harper's Bazaar Art Arabia and a frequent contributor to many of the foremost arts and culture publications, including Artnet News, The Art Angle Podcast, Freeze, Vogue Arabia, Bloomberg Business Week Middle East, Arab News, and the New York Times' T Magazine, among others. Rebecca plays an active role in the discussion of the topics she specializes in, regularly moderating panels on arts and culture in the Middle East and internationally. This makes her uniquely qualified to talk about the situation in Lebanon. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Rebecca Ann Proctor, who is very fittingly speaking to us from Beirut today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Aiden. And yes, I am in Beirut and, um, and, I've, and I arrived two days ago actually from Dubai. And, and as you know, when you when you asked me to do this talk, I've been I've been covering the explosions nonstop since um, since the fourth of August. I've been covering you know I've been coming to Beirut since two thousand seven. Actually, it was when I was in, in graduate school in Paris, and I went first basically to to party to to enjoy Beirut with friends, um, and I fell in love with it. I as 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 you said, I it's it's almost impossible not to fall in love with your country. You know, its beauty, its people, the hospitality, the Mediterranean sunlight, and you know I've. I've wanted to come over the last two months. I've struggled myself as a journalist reporting so much. Everyone asked me, will you write on the explosions? Will you write on Beirut? Um, and having written now from it on the explosions from afar, um, being on the phone, hearing people scream, cry, laugh, you know, um, in this extremely, extremely difficult time, I just, I, I really needed to be here. And I'd planned to come anyways, actually early August. And I was told by, by dear friends here actually to postpone my trip. They usually say, yella, yella, come, come, Rebecca, enjoy Beirut. And this time they, they weren't, um, they were hesitant. It's like they knew that something was about to happen. Um, and I had actually just written an article um, about a week before the explosions that was called Lebanon Faces the Abyss. And it was more of a, a political article on, on you know, what you've just summed up as the very dire and, and challenging circumstances that the country is going through, the, you know, the economic, um, 
the worsening economic crisis, the issues with the banks, um, you know, the, all transferring money, all sorts of things that like cuts in electricity. And so the abyss happened and I'm here. I've, I'm, and I'm so happy I've come. Um, I'm having a wonderful time. Um, people are warm and friendly as ever. And it's just, the city is, is beautiful. Um, and so I'd like to kind of first talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'll, I'm going to introduce a bit what I do and obviously the Beirut cultural scene. And, and we will talk about the intersection between art and politics and um, basically, you know, intercultural development, which I believe strongly in. Um, but I, I want to first start off with showing some videos and about my experience the first day going to Ground Zero and seeing um, what I thought to be honest, I prepared myself for the worst. I thought I was gonna come to the city that I love so dearly and see, um, basically see the, the it torn to pieces. Um, what I've been really astonished by, and I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it as a journalist, um, as a journalist and as a human being that, re that really loves this country, it's been a big part of my life, a big part of decision to study Middle Eastern studies, conflict resolution, and also live in the Middle East and report for 11 and a half years now. Um, I've been astonished at how quickly the Lebanese have picked up and rebuilt. Um, in the last two days, I've gone to an art exhibition. Um, I've, I went to an, a restaurant that just opened two days ago. Um, people have invited me every night out for dinner. Um, restaurants are completely, um, yeah, completely blasted. There's, you know, Liza, which you probably know is a very famous restaurant. I went there last night and the windows are shattered, you know, you can't go inside, but yet they've they've used the courtyard, which is absolutely stunning, as the terrace to host dinners. So I was there yesterday. So it's, um, there's a lot of contradictions right now. There's this contradiction, this juxtaposition between the incredible beauty, Mediterranean beauty of Lebanon, the kindness, the warmness of the people, and then the horror, because people are traumatized, you know. Um, and it's, you know, it's like I've just said, it's the two year, two month um, anniversary of the Beirut explosions. And so on a motorbike with a dear friend of mine who's started and actually I'm staying with her and in the next room, she started an NGO called Babel Shebek. Um, you might've heard of it already, Mariana Webbe. And there's a bunch of Lebanese um, young adults, your ages, um, who are coming every morning. I wake up, I get my coffee and they're working there to uh, reconstruct the city. Basically it's an NGO that is raising funds and it goes and people call them and they come and they find the glass and the wood and stuff to repair the homes. Um, and winter's coming and so they're, you know, the girl who just actually helped me set this up in the next room because Wi-Fi isn't so great here right now. You know, she was telling me how, um, you know, they're a bit nervous. They hope that the work they've done is gonna last the winter when it gets cold. Um, but they're working day and night. These are, um, these are young adults that are at school or have just finished school who are, you know, kind of working between helping their city rebuild and also working, trying to get back out in the economy. Um, and it's, and they're, um, they're full of life. They're full of laughter and, and very spirited, um, you know, as you, you guys are very charming and, and still joking and uh, there's, they're, they're suffering. They've gone through a lot of trauma, but you know, it's, uh, they're out there and picking it up fast. Um, so I, what I'd like to kind of, while I'm going to talk the inter, this interrelationship between art and conflict and, and going forward, um, what I'd like to stress and that I'm going to now put on some videos to share with you on that first morning that I went on the motorbike, um, is that for me, this country um, has used art, um, has used creativity uh, I, I, as, a, as a means of really um, it's their pride, it's their dignity. They're, I haven't, I have traveled the world. I reported, you know, from the West Bank, from Iran, from um, also all places in Africa. I'm doing a lot with African art right now, but I haven't ever met um, ever really um, a people that has, there's been really invaded and, and they've suffered so many explosions. Um, you know, this is the worst explosion, obviously. The first time I visited Beirut was 2007 and it, it was just after the Israeli invasion. So that's 14 years since the Israeli invasion. And I saw it year by year um, downtown Beirut, you know, pick up where you could go down and go shopping and go to Chanel. I mean, I just went to my friend's office today and Chanel is all boarded up. There's a big tank in front of it. Um, all the cafes are closed and it took years to build that back up again after the Israeli invasion. And now we're back down again to the same state, if not worse. Um, but what I, what I want to say is that art, this creative, creative creativity, whether it be through art, whether it be through music, whether it be through design, through architecture, um, 
through also through um, this emergency response, you know, you guys, the diaspora outside Impact Lebanon, which, bases, which is based in, in, in London, um, whether it be New York or Los Angeles, the response of the Lebanese diaspora to creatively um, help uh, raise funds for their country in the absence of no government, there's been no government support, as you know, um, is incredible. And for me, that's also um, an example of creativity. So there's this, this real spirit of pride, pride in art and pride in culture uh, to continue to persevere. Um, but I will say right now is, you know, it's two months, people are still traumatized. Every time I speak to someone, every time I go out to dinner, there's a talk about the explosion, how to go through, what, you know, how to go forward, what's the future holding, but people have rebuilt quickly. Um, before I continue, so let me just, I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, that's working. So this is So that's the, can you see that picture? Yes. So that's, yeah. ground, so that's ground zero. I'll show you a video now of it. So that's where, um, this is the port of Beirut. And so that's where the explosion took off. And as you can see, it's, it's <laughs> in some ways it looks like this strange object I was saying to a designer last night. It's, if you look at it, it's just this horrifying reminder that people drive past every day. Um, and around it is, 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 is disaster, disaster zone. Um, After, after going through, you can see that it's still pretty destroyed. So this is the area of Mama Hale, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> Anyways, 
Um, Rebecca, I think it's important to note for context and for those who don't know that what you're seeing right now is our version of Soho. Well, was no, I just wanted to say for context, uh, it's important to note that the video you're seeing right now was our version of Soho. And yeah. like where all the bars were and the nightlife. Exactly. And I, and this is, so this is Jameza and, and Marma Khayal, which are literally the beating heart and spirit of Beirut. Um, I'll show a little bit more of this and then I'll, I'll, I'll start talking and then I can show some artwork and intersperse with them some explanation. But yes, I, I think it's, it's important to note and, and you'll see as we go through the streets, uh, they've rebuilt quite a lot already. I know you've seen some and some destruction just now. I was really astonished. It's the beating heart and soul of Beirut. You have all the, you have the designer boutiques, you have the art galleries, you have, um, you have beautiful restaurants. I mean, usually when I go to Beirut over the years, whether it's, be, whether, whether it's for, you know, weddings or for, um, <laughs> weddings or for work or for hanging out with friends. I mean, this is, you go to these streets and they're packed. Everybody's out. Everyone's, you know, really, you know, it's like, yeah, your version of Soho in London or in New York, for example. Um, so let me just show a little bit more. But yeah, I think for contracts, people that don't know Beirut, and that's why I feel it's important for them to see these videos to just get a little sense um, of the situation now. Um, but yes, this is, it's an extremely beautiful part. This is, it hit literally the best part, you know, um, the most prestigious part of the city. Uh, this was this beautiful uh, building. Yeah. The East Village Tower. Yeah. We're gallery tenants. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah. The tenant of Mariana. Yeah. Bringing the. Uh, yes, gallery tenant. Uh, a lot of art galleries. This gallery you see is completely destroyed. Um, they're rebuilding. Okay, um, so I just, I, I think that's just important to give context as to the situation today, um, which, is, which is where I want to take, you know, start this talk. And I'm so glad I came before giving this talk because I've spoken so much about Lebanon and I just don't, I, I don't, I really feel that I need to speak, I need to be here to kind of report more and to do justice to it, sort of my own research and my own, um, yeah, my own way of, of my own coverage of, of, the, of what's happened here. But as you see that there is still um, destruction, but there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of rebuilding already. Um, there's a restaurant, Taulet, that just opened, um, like I said, three days ago, I went to have lunch there. People opened up new homes um, where they moved furniture around, they're starting from scratch. Um, and the question that I keep hearing over the past few days is, is this cr creative, we're gonna call it creative resilience. Um, is it a good thing when the Lebanese state hasn't done anything to help its people? Maybe that's something we could talk about in, in the sort of um, the Q&A afterwards. Uh, there's this incredible spirit of the Lebanese people to pick up the pieces quickly and move on. I, don't, I, I really was astonished. Uh, uh, the, the resiliency, a lot of Lebanese, you know, right after the explosions, I wrote several pieces for Artnet, um, Art Newspaper, and people yelled at me on the phone and they said, we do not want to be called resilient anymore, Rebecca. We're tired of being called resilient. We just... We just want to live normal lives. Um, resilience is 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 a is a is a word that you almost can't take away from the Lebanese character. It's become part and parcel of what it means to be Lebanese. These are people that have been broken so many times, but they always find a way to creatively kind of rise above the situation. Um, but there is a resilience. We can't deny it. Whether they want to be called resilient or not resilient. Um, what I saw is resilient, you know, the, the fact that you, the NGO that's meeting in the next room from me here, the fact that they started just a few, just hours after the explosion to start an NGO to help pick up the pieces of their country and there are countless other NGOs 
is an act of resilience. You know, they've just, the people knew that the government wasn't going to do anything. So they, the people have been the government, as you guys um, probably have been following. Um, and so people have been, as I've met people over the last few days, the, the question is, there's a pride in how quickly they've responded to the situation and quickly creatively responded to the situation um, to preserve, I think, their sense of dignity and pride when everything has been taken from them, literally, you know? People have lost everything, as you said, Aya. That what they have is the art. They have their creativity. They have, you know, they have their history. And that, I think, for me, what I've, what I've been trying to also kind of um, sum up over the last few days and through my writing is that's, that's their identity, you know, through this, this creativity, through this art. Um, but people are questioning it because, you know, is it good to, to pick up so quickly um, when the government hasn't done anything and, and, and probably is not going to do anything unless there's complete ch structural change? Um, and that's something I'm not, you know, I'm not equipped to answer. A lot of people, there is no answer, really. It's something that needs to be debated because, you know, in a situation like this where you, um, you have a government that's literally abused its people, the people are obliged to pick up quickly so that they can survive, you know, so that they can, you know, have a house. Um, and art, art and creativity becomes the spirit, you know, the defining spirit of the way forward. It's, a, it's, it's the only way for hope. And there is a lot of hopelessness here right now. A lot of people... You know, I think there's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of, you know, um, yeah, uh, ups and downs, as you can imagine. Um, so there are many people leaving Lebanon right now, many artists, creatives, architects, and countless others for a better life. You know, I sat down with an artist last night and who's, um, his, he was showing at Gallery Tenet and the show exploded. He was planning to leave for months because of the economic, situ economic situation. And he said he's leaving next month. Other people I know are staying. They want to fight it out. You know, they want to stay. They love their country. So there's this this incredible sense of contradiction right now of of this you know the beauty of the city. I'm so happy to be here. Really, I, I it makes me it's it's to be honest, it's a great break from Dubai. It's it's still incredible food, incredible people, and warmth. But there's the horror of this extremely dark moment and the catastrophe. You know, the trauma, like after any catastrophe is still there, you know, it's going to be there for a long time and it will be there forever. This will be in the history books, um, particularly in the absence of, of, um, of social justice. Um, so it's crucial to underline before I go further into this talk um, that, again, I just want to stress that there's been no, um, no new government in place. The government resigned. No solution to Lebanon's worsening economic crisis. Billions of damages from the explosion, I, as you've said, thousands still wounded and displaced, and an ongoing investigation into the explosion that has yet to yield results. We do not know, but this wasn't, as many people are saying, it's, it's very clear that it's not an accident because you don't just, something just doesn't explode by itself in this, in this, in this way. Um, and I think just to kind of put things in perspective, the Beirut explosions come 14 years after the 2006 Lebanon War, which was known as the July War in Lebanon, which ravaged the country for 33 days. I visited Lebanon for the first time in March 2007, just as the, just as the country was recovering. Um, and and I, I fell in love with it again. There were checkpoints everywhere. You couldn't walk down downtown a bit like today, but it still had this spirit. I, you know, the spirit of, of you know, of, of resilience, of continuity. Um, and a question that I'd like to kind of bring out at the end, because again, I don't see these talks right now as, as I've been doing a lot of them and I, and I, and I love doing them. I love raising awareness, um, particularly for people that's, you know, using creative means, art particularly, I think as a way forward. Um, a question that comes to mind a lot is, can art, can creative initiatives bring about social justice? Um, I particularly think you need to bring in, poli there needs to be po political and structural change, but I do believe the arts are, are a great vehicle for, for transcending conflict and for working for, with other cultures and other peoples that have been in conflict situations. So um, I just, I'd like to share this quote by John Tusa in an, in an article that's called For Art's Sake, and it was published in Prospect Magazine in January, 1997. He writes, the arts matter not for the instrumental reasons, but, f but because, they are universal because they are non-material, because they deal with daily experience in a different way, because they transform the way we look at the world, because they offer different explanations of the world, because they link us to our past and open the door to the future, because they work outside routine categories, because they take us out of ourselves, because they make order out of disorder and stir up the stagnant with movement, because they offer a shared experience rather than an isolated one, 
because they encourage the imagination and attempt the pointless, because they offer beauty and confront us with the fact of ugliness, because they offer explanations but no solutions, because they offer a vision of integration rather than disintegration, because they force us to think about the difference between the good and the bad, the false and the true. Since writing my master's thesis in 2008 on conflict resolution in children's art, in which I spent several weeks working with uh, Muslim and Christian Lebanese children in the SOS Children's Village of Kasarnava in the Beka Valley in Lebanon, I then pursued a career that I write that regularly had me confront um, beauty and luxury, because I, you know, at Harper's I was covering Chanel, you know, Chanel at Couture Week and Ali Saab and, you know, countless other extremely extravagant things um, from, an art, his, from an art perspective or a luxury perspective or design perspective. But then at the same time, I was traveling, you know, to places like the West Bank to cover art exhibitions in areas that are still marred by restrictions imposed by Israeli settlers. Um, or I've been to places in Africa where it's very difficult, uh, most places where it's still very difficult for artists to, to have access to art materials, but they still find ways of, creati of creating art. And I've often asked myself, how can something aesthetic and often a beauty that is man-created help a suffering people? There's no scientific explanation for this, except for the fact that I, as you know, the quote I just recited says, art unites people and artistic creation has been practiced since the beginning of time. Can art change the world? <laughs> it's a big question. Um, you know, a lot of people um, doubt that. Um, it might not be able to structurally change the world, but it offers perspectives, new perspectives. How can art you, be used in humanitarian projects and conflict situations um, be a means in the process of attaining peace? What power do the arts have? How many people today would even pose such questions? You know, they seem kind of, I think for the, you know, at some points they seem quite fluffy and quite, you know, superfluous. To ask these questions opens up a whole new perspective on the problems of our times. And I believe, you know, we're living in a period, I mean, particularly this year, everything's been thrown out the window. In some ways, you know, we're not living, we don't have a World War III, but we're, we're the world's living in a state of war. Um, Present geopolitics are marked by wars of culture. A lot of the, the geopolitics that we're facing today, the, the struggles you know, all around the world. I mean, right now we have a crisis in, in Armenia. I don't know, that's not making really the headlines because we have as much as we have the US elections where I'm from and, and um, then we had you know, floods in Sudan, fires in California, there's the coronavirus, of course. And all of these conflicts are ultimately um, linked to culture, even coronavirus for that matter, but I'm not going to talk about coronavirus because I think we've talked about that way too much. This, I mean, we're talking about a lot every day. Conflicts, once solely political, have become, I, I believe, at once cultural and social around the world. There's always a link, whether it be, you know, socioeconomic or that be religious, whether it be, ident I, you know, identity driven or race driven. I mean, we saw in June, um, that's a whole other topic, which I'm not going to get into, but it is, it is an example of of all of the racism, you know, the sort of going back to colonial times, and I know that was happening in the UK and in the US and bringing up these scars that haven't been, that haven't been healed, you know, and I think a lot of that's been perpetuated by the tension that we're facing around the world with coronavirus and the lockdowns and these political systems that are also grappling and struggling with the changes. So the conflicts that we're facing right now are, um, are, yeah, are wars of culture in some ways. And so we have to, I think the arts in many ways are needed more than ever to kind of heal and to understand each other. Um, what I have found in my, in my reporting on art and culture throughout the Middle East and in places that, create, that created, creativity exists everywhere. Art exists everywhere, even in the most horrifying of situations. Um, I, you know, most recently a curator told me in, in Ethiopia, you know, Ethiopia went through a terrible famine in the 1980s. Um, they didn't have enough food. In fact, that country became sort of stigmatized as the famine, you know, country. And this curator told me, she sort of laughed. Um, she said, art is just as important as food and water for the people here. And I was a bit surprised because a lot of you know, social scientists would probably laugh at that. And I, I said, why? And, and she said, art gives people a will to move forward and it gives them a sense of hope. And while I'm not, you know, that, that's, that's another debate, but while the precedence of art over food and water can certainly be debated and we can't deny the necessity of, of, basic, nutrition, of basic nutrition in order to create um, art and culture, what we can't deny is the importance of creativity as a means to channel change, to transcend moments of, difficult, of, dif of, of difficulty and conflict. So even when artists don't have access to specific materials like paper, paint, paintbrushes, other items. Um, for example, last, last year I wrote an article, you can find it on Artnet, but it was about um, the sanctions on, on Iran. And a lot of those artists, um, for a while, they, couldn't, they didn't have enough money to buy paper. The paper actually wasn't, they, 
paper wasn't even coming into Iran because of the lack of, of money. Um, it was really difficult to get certain types of paper to do the art. But they found a way to creativ creatively um, get over those hurdles. They didn't stop creating, a bit like in Lebanon right now. They just kept on with their art. It was very important for them. And I, I found um, Iran is also in some ways similar to Lebanon. They've had so much, so, so much, so many challenges that the art has become a source of pride, a real source of pride and spirit for these people. Um, and um, so conflict is part of the human condition and working out this conflict is usually a creative and a productive process. So I think, I think I have this degree in conflict resolution. While I'm, I'm not, I'm not a diplomat. I'm a journalist. I'm, I loved writing and I sort of fell into this and I've now done reporting everywhere. Um, when you think about resolving conflict, uh, that is creative in itself. You know, you need to find a way to empathize with two sides, two sides that, no, that don't agree. Um, and so if you bring art into the equation, something that is, that is, it's not quantifiable, it is subjective, but it is universal, you know, and the absence of sort of a common language, maybe even a common religion, if you can use an artwork, if you can use, um, or even a common experience through images when you can't have the language, that's a way of, of bringing people together that aren't, that maybe don't see eye to eye. And I, I do believe that. I mean, we, there's, there's a lot of different examples of, of, of children particularly, I think, that have been able to use sort of, whether it be sport or whether it be dance, um, the art to kind of work together. And I think that it can be a really important tool. Um, so conflict has a complex history through which its meaning has shifted and narrowed. Today, the, ter today the term art functions as one of a series of categories whose purpose is to assist in the construction and maintenance of a hierarchy of values which, having been constructed, can be made to appear both natural and inevitable. So again, art, the struggle where you have, in, you know, if you bring art next to economics or next to social science, which is something I struggled with after I did an, a master's in art history and then I did this degree in conflict resolution, is that you can't, there's no data that can quantify art. You know, you can't, you can't look at a painting and say, oh, the color red, um, you know, the color red, by seeing the color red, it's going to help this many people and it's going to solve this issue. You just know that there, you know subjectively that there is some sort of transmission of energy or some sort of um, commonality um, to an experience of, of beauty, an experience of, of culture. Uh, so the arts are a selection, if you kind of break it down, a, the, the arts are a selection of human activities usually connected with pleasure. The Lebanese people, going back to Lebanon, love pleasure. They love beautiful things. Um, I find that a lot with the Mediterranean people. There's a there's a common love for, for, um, for art and for culture. And I've been invited to an art exhibition tomorrow, for example, in an, in Saleh Barakat Gallery, which was um, extremely devastated. They even lost um, they lost one of their staff members, Firas, a really really nice man. He died, but he's he's opening tomorrow. Um, the man's money is stuck in the bank. Um, he's made it, it's, he's in a very difficult situation, but he's having an art show. He's bringing people together. Um, despite the fact that the Lebanese don't know what's happening, there are these, that's what I'm astonished by. There are these acts right now of resilience through art, through creativity. Um, so just, just sort of to sum up, because you know, I don't want to go over time here. I want to obviously open this up to questions. Throughout history, we see examples whereby the arts have helped societies in conflict by providing comfort to people and serving as a means to question and challenge unjust social structures. So, you know, right now, where I am in Lebanon, because we're focusing on that today, is, is an unjust social structure. A lot of people, a lot of artists I spoke to when I was reporting for Artnet and art newspaper and stuff, a lot of them told me, you know, speaking to Rebecca makes me just want to go out and paint. I just want to go out and create something. The act of creating in some ways gives you an answer. Maybe it, maybe it will help you channel in some way and people see, I've seen graffiti all over, for example, the um, downtown these days, Hope or Beirut, Levon. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of a lot of people have created a lot, um, which I will show you now from this exhibition that I attended two days ago of all these new sculpture works people have created, trying to explore and understand the conflict and heal. It is often during the worst historical crises, such as the Holocaust or recent or, you know, there was also, as you know, Bosnia Herzegovina, that people, um, or the, Isra the Israeli and Palestinian conflict or Israeli and Lebanon, the people have turned to the arts for inspiration, emotional release and resistance. Um, artists often challenge existing prejudices, build bridges between diverse communities. I believe that in the absence of a shared language, what people have is a shared visual language. 
as I've just said before. Um, and I, I think that this is what's in some ways not in some ways, in many ways, it's it's been the, like, as I'm going back to what I've said in the beginning, it's a source of pride for the Lebanese people right now. It is a way forward. It's a way to generate hope. It's not the answer, though. I, I and that's something I want to explore. You need, you need structural change, but it's a, a step towards that change. And just to quote um, American philosopher Martha Nussbaum to give more examples in terms of how I think art can play a role in civic di dialogue. Um, I don't believe you can separate art from politics. I believe the artist ultimately is extremely affected and engaged with the society around them. Um, so in Sex and Social Justice, um, Martha, New Martha Nussbaum devises a list of 10 fundamental capabilities or eventual actions for the well-being of any society. Um, and several of the capabilities Nussbaum lists relate to the role of art that can play in civic dialogue. So civic dialogue meaning meaning the role that people can play with their society, with their government, how they can come together um, and foster change. So in number four, she says, senses, imagination, and thought, being able to use the senses, being able to imagine, to think, and to reason, to dream of something new, and to do these things in a way informed and cultivated by an adequate education, being able to use imagination and thought in connection with experiencing and producing expressive works and, and events of one's choice, being able to use one's mind, in ways protected by guarantees of freedom of expression with respect to both political and artistic speech and freedom of religious exercise, being able to have pleasurable experiences to avoid non-beneficial pain. So the Lebanese certainly do not lack um, imagination. And I think what I'd like to stress kind of on, on the back of that statement of, of Nussbaum is the fact that Beirut's been the bastion of freedom in the Middle East. This is a place where you know, Muslims, Jews, um, Christians, um, they've come together. There's 18, I mean, Aya, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, there's 18 different religious sects. There have been wars between them. It's, it's a huge struggle. It's a small country, but people have been living side by side. Um, and there is an extreme amount of, of um, freedom of expression here. It's, Beirut is known for that, you know, the arts and the cultural scene. And other places of the Middle East, there still are, um, due to, um, you know, cultural restrictions and some and cultural and religious restrictions, and one has to respect those. Um, oftentimes, it's difficult to speak about certain things. I mean, but Beirut was the place where you could come and you could be in some ways free. You know, this was the place, um, and it still is the place. You know, it's filled with journalists, filled with intellectuals. It's been called the Paris of the Middle East. And that's why it's so vital um, to preserve it. You know, um, Saleh Barakat told me, you know, two days after the explosion, and he was on the phone with me from the hospital, but he said, we, we need to get our story out right now because if we don't, we risk becoming another Gaza, another Palestine. You know, this was the place where the you know, Palestinians have come here. Obviously they came here because they had to leave their home. Um, but people from around the Middle East to explore art, to explore dance, to explore freedom of, of, of thought. And that's Beirut. And it's literally the capital of art and culture in the entire Manasseh region, an entire Middle East from Morocco to Egypt to um, from Saudi Arabia to the Gulf states, Beirut has been looked on, looked upon as literally the capital of, of expression, of, of art and culture. And that's what they're so proud about. Um, and that's what I see now, even to this day. Um, so what I'd like to argue is that the arts here, um, creativity has served what I've seen over the last few days, and I'm staying now for, um, for about an, another 10 days here, is creativity has served as a path towards transcending present ills. The restrictions, as a Lebanese dealer once told me, have in some ways, there's when I say restrictions, I mean sort of banking restrictions, economic restrictions, like electricity restrictions, even Wi-Fi restrictions, as I'm experiencing it now as well, have enhanced the Lebanese sense of creativity. You know, that might be argued in the West. I once said that when I was with some, some friends in New York. Um, sometimes the restrictions I found placed on a people, you know, enforce their desire to create. I found that in Saudi Arabia, for example, and I just touch upon it quickly, there's, there were so many restrictions for so long and now Saudi Arabia is opening up. I mean, they're dealing with their own coronavirus situation, but it actually enforced their own way of, of expression. They have a very conceptual art in Saudi Arabia and they couldn't, they couldn't really draw figures. I mean, um, there, there was, a, there was a, obviously a restriction in terms of what type of, of art to, to do, but they found other means of expression. Lebanese have also, in this period, um, found that maybe there's been walls, but they've been able to push against those walls to do something else, um, to, do, to experiment. And maybe through experimenting, 
that's what I'd like to argue that experimenting can bring about societal change, I hope very much. So, and now I'll just show a few pictures of this exhibition that I just went to. What I want to leave with, and I don't have an answer to this, um, and because I do, I do believe, as you say, that, you know, and I'm seeing it here on the ground that arts, um, that the art, art is a way, our, art and resilience are, um, are part and parcel of, of a people, you know, I, and, and a spirit and a hope. But they're not, um, unless you have structural change and political change, and the arts, I think, can be a vehicle to achieve that change, um, Lebanon can't get to the future it needs to get. There needs to be a complete, <laughs> you know, I'm not here, this is not a political discussion, but there needs to be complete structural change at the political level. No one denies that. The arts and creativity are means to rise above the current despair. They're, they're ways to move on and transcend and, and as I just said, you know, vehicles to resort, restore a sense of pride and dignity. And the Lebanese, for the Lebanese, and you know, I, you are Lebanese, um, the arts, the jewelry designers, the fashion designers, you know, when I went to Couture Week, kind of my old, in my old role as editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar Art, the majority of Couture designers are Lebanese, you know, they are so good at what they do of their craft. Um, that's their pride, that's their dignity, and they will hold on to that in any way they can to keep their sense of self. And I think I realized, you know, particularly during this very crazy time that we're all living in, you know, one's identity, one's history, you know, we're all, we're all kind of mixed at this, in this day and age. We've all lived in different cultures, but your identity is such an important part of who you are. You know, your family, where you're from, where you've lived, where you've grown up. It's, you know, even me, I've been, you know, a third of my life now is spent in the Middle East, and, and it's part of me. It will always be part of me. Um, but the problem is, is again, going back to this, people in Lebanon are questioning resilience. They're questioning how much more do you have to take? You know, is it okay for the creative, is it okay? I'll leave that for an open discussion. Is it okay for the arts community to just go on and just keep opening exhibitions to celebrate life, to say that I'm okay, I'm gonna just keep on creating my work um, when you know, the situation is worsening on a daily, on a daily basis? How do, you, how do you balance these contradictions? I don't have an answer. I'm struggling with it myself because um, you have a situation here where the government's done nothing. Even after Hiroshima, the government um, resigned. The government here has resigned, but there's no new government and there's no path to economic reform. There's no IMF, you know, IMF, there's been no deal that's been put in place, which is actually what is probably the, the band-aid that needs to happen in the short term, not the long term. There's no, no, there's no sense of future, no plan for the future. So is it okay to go forward as if, it, as if nothing, I'm not saying as if nothing's happened, but I, what I'm noticing is that there is a pride in kind of saying that, you're, that we're okay, that we're gonna go forward. Um, that's what people are debating here and they're struggling with it. They don't know how to handle that. Um, will things, you know, someone just, my friend who's over in the other room, um, she asked at lunch, because I was speaking about this talk, and she said, you know, we're battling with, there's this sense that things are just kind of going back the way they were. Is that okay? After you have a situation like this, is that okay? But then is it okay to do nothing and have the government do nothing? You know, where, where is the middle ground? I'm not sure if there is one. Um, and it's, this is, it's a really, really difficult question. Um, before I conclude, I more or less concluded this, um, but I just want to show the, ex the some images of the, I think I might have gone over time, so I am sorry. Um, but I just want to- No worries, no worries. Okay? I'll just show the ex this, some images from this exhibition, which is really amazing. It's at um, Art House, the, this, if anybody in the audience, or if you guys come to Beirut, you should definitely visit it. Art House is a boutique hotel in, in Marma Hale that just um, was planning to open around the, ex around the explosions, but had to postpone because the roof fell off, the windows were blasted. Um, and so instead they had this incredible exhibition, a lot of newly commissioned artworks by artists from the Middle East and from predominantly Le Lebanon. All of, the proceeds, all of the proceeds are going to the Lebanese Red Cross. Um, and just on that note, I think it's important to note that um, most, of the, um, most of the initiatives worldwide to raise money for Lebanon have been creative initiatives. And in, in New York, there was a whole thing of you know, going out to the restaurant, you know, enjoying the pleasures of life while paying for something that the money will go to Lebanon. Or there's been countless art auctions where you buy art, the money goes to Lebanon. So, even in the way of raising money, it's been creative. You know, it's been this 
Lebanese spirit of enjoying life, but giving back. So I, I think that's really quite exceptional. Um, so just to share my screen again, I will, where is the, can you see? Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. Okay. Good. I just want to, um, well, actually, no, first, before the exhibition, so this is not a Debs, um, and she's one of Lebanon's foremost designers, and I literally, when I had lunch with her, and, and I featured her many times in Harper's Bazaar Interiors, and she has an incredible showroom, and she literally had put kind of the finishing touches of reorganizing the showroom, and again, it's in Marma Hail, uh, Marma Hail, in, um just two days ago, so I walked in, and this is what I saw, and it's, it's beautiful. There's, um, oh gosh, these aren't in order. <laughs> so you have to excuse me again, if there's some Wi-Fi issues, but um, that's a destroyed building as you see, um, but just getting, um, so that's, I'll, not a Debs will come back up. I'm just gonna go one by one and kind of, wait a second, why is this doing that? Um, this is what not a Debs has on the, the door of her space. A lot of spaces that you see in Beirut now have this um, message to people about the will to go on. So this is what she's put. Our space is destroyed, but we are not. And as you'll see in, in some of the images, her space now is, is beaming with light and there's new design objects. She's going out with a new product line. She told me last night, she said, I don't know really what the future holds, but I need to go on. People need to start their lives again. They need to make money. They need to make products. Um, but this is what's on her door. That's the building again. In, in, in this district that's, you know, it's being restored right now, as you can see, being rebuilt. Again, every single act of restoration and rebuilding in Beirut has been by the people. The Lebanese people, in some way, someone laughed almost, they, it's like they didn't even need a government. They've all done it themselves. They've raised money. The money came through the bank and they've, they've started rebuilding through these, you know, as you can see. And so this is the exhibition in Art House. Um, this is a work by Mahmoud Obeidi. He's a quite a well-known Iraqi artist, um, and it's been, it's here, um, ready to be bought. So that's the, that's one of the rooms. You can see works by um, on the right, paintings by Eamon Balbaki and Tegrid um, Darguth. They're some of Lebanon's foremost. Um, painters and in the forefront, there's a sculpture by Hadi, Hadi Sai. Uh, he's a mixed uh, Senegalese Lebanese uh, sculptor. He has some sculpt sculptures downtown in downtown Beirut right now. Right now. Um, that's Nada Debs, is, um, that's a room in her, in her showroom. And this is Art House, the boutique hotel. You can see, you know, they've um, spruced it up and there's a beautiful pool. You can get a drink now there. <laughs> Um, this is on the way to Art House. This is a view. And that's inside Art House. So that's uh, an installation by Alfred Tarazzi. He's a Lebanese, uh, Lebanese artist. Um, again, a lot of these artists are already opening up their studios. They, they heard I was here. So they said, will you come to the studio? They, I, they want to show me their new work. You know, they've all created work since the explosions. And this is one of the works he's created. I think, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I think this is, I think this is called Beirut, but I don't want to Anyway, it's, it's about the city and it's about sort of the explosion of the city after, after, in the aftermath. Um, and as you can see, this is a beautiful old um, um, home, heritage home. That's another thing to point out to the people watching is that a lot of the buildings that have been destroyed are beautiful heritage homes with exceptional architecture. So the Lebanese are really proud of that. Uh, Sursuk Museum, for example, is, you know, it's, it was already, it, already, it had already gone on, gone, un, gone under a lengthy restoration process. So this is architecture. This is part of the history of the city. People are trying to rebuild it to, um, to, to keep hold of, of their heritage. Manuela um, Giragosan is a painter. Her father is Paul Giragosan. He's a very famous um, painter in Lebanon. This is at Art House as well. Another view. This is Nada Debs. So you can see the showroom is, there's been a lot of restoration. She's picked up the pieces fast. Um, these are her design works. This is another painting at Art House. As you can see, the Lebanese flag. Um, it's another view. This is at Art House again, so you can see the, the artworks there. Um, Katia Trebosi's sculpture in the back, the pool. 
you know, you can see the beauty of Beirut at this time of year is just glorious. Um, again, not a Debs. You can see in this, um, the, this, uh, um, I forget how you say this sort of closet of doors in the back, it's slightly dented. As she pointed out to me, I came in, I thought, oh, this is so well, it's so well preserved, but there's dents from the explosion. So it is damaged. She's actually been going um, to the homes of a lot of the collectors of her pieces. And some of the pieces have, can be restored and other ones can't be restored, but she's trying to, trying to do what she can. Um, that's also at Art House, one of the views. This roof, the roof on top had to be repaired. So they've done that pretty quickly. Again, Alfred Tarazzi. Um, this is, I just wanted to end with this and I, you know, I'm, I might be kind of jumping, but this is, this is a work that was done in 2008 when I was with these children in uh, the Becca Valley and I was doing my thesis on conflict resolution in children's art. And I still believe this piece is a bit of a work in progress, but I basically had the kids draw um, their home and thoughts on their home and, and everyday life. And this, this was done again, as you can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but the two planes above um, carry the um, Israeli flag. I didn't tell them to create anything about war or bombing, okay? So this is just months, not even a year after the Israeli invasion. And this girl, I think this girl was four years old, four or five years old. And the man on, on my right um, side, he's holding a gun and he's smiling and, and he's shooting the woman who's watering the flowers. And the woman is clearly a Lebanese woman and under and each flower, what I find is incredible for a girl who's four years old, each flower has, is, um, is painted so meticulously, so beautifully, you know, and but the woman is bleeding, who's watering the flowers. Um, and there's stars in the sky and there's the tree. And this is a girl who's four years old. And, you know, this was 14 years ago, you know? I don't know, I don't know this girl anymore. But she was in my class in the study. Um, and this is what she saw, you know, this is her reality. And I, I think about this drawing a lot because I, I can't believe that, you know, you're four years old, you can't articulate the war, you can't articulate what's happened, but they obviously have an understanding of that at that young age. And to paint something, to draw something that's so detailed, um, particularly the flowers, I mean, I find that really amazing that, you know, I mean, maybe that's sort of the Lebanese creativity, but you look, look at every single flower is different. But the man shooting the woman is smiling and she's not smiling. And if a, if a child, and that's what I want to leave this on, if a child, and that's where I think there could be change through art, if a child can draw that and a child can understand that, that conflict in that way at such a young age, that means that, that that's where you need to start the change. That's where the arts need to come in. I think that's where the conflict resolution needs to come in is with, really with the young children because that's what will stay with them, you know, for the rest of their lives. And conflict is is intergenerational you know the <clears throat> i won't get into the whole israel palestinian thing or the holocaust but they're all part and parcel of trauma and pain and so this has been going on for generations and generations and generations if you start with kids if you find a way to start with kids maybe through art through expression um through understanding i i think i would hope and that's where i i believe and i'm you know i'm studying this and going forward myself and, and this work that I'd, I'd like to do and which I think is important. I'd hope that there are ways to do to change to change perception. That's where I think the arts can play a vital role. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really I Lebanon is very dear to my heart. And um, this these explosions have affected me very much as well. I haven't been here. I've just been reporting um, from a distance, but I, I, um, this is a very beautiful part of the world. It's very close to, to Israel, to Palestine, to this whole very beautiful region. And I hope that one day there won't be this much violence. So, and again, I also believe very strongly in the arts and culture and creativity to foster change. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, if you have a, if you have a little bit of extra time, we could uh, go through a few questions. You don't have to 
give super elaborate answers, but it would be uh, fantastic to get your thoughts on some of these. Um, so sure. the first yeah. one we have is from Abdul Kawi, who says, how do you think the response and sentiment in Lebanon as a result of the explosion may have been different in a time before social media and mass exposure to global crises? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. I, uh, you know, the, the response on social media and these images uh, that everyone was sharing was so, was so incredible. It was like a real plea for help. Um, but without social media, as much as I think everybody kind of struck back and forth, we're so kind of addicted to it. But without all those images really blasting to the world, people wouldn't have known. This is a very small country, you know, but the but people just kept sharing. People kept sharing the protests, for example, the protests that happened a week after the explosion. People went live at the protests. So I think if we hadn't had social media, if we hadn't had... Um, these, the internet actually ways that you could share the images and share expression and share emotion and share art. Um, I don't know if the, I don't even, yeah, I don't know if the, even the Lebanese diaspora, maybe, maybe things, maybe Lebanese diaspora, even, you know, other people may, may have been able to rally together to help as much because this really, the whole world felt the pain, you know, and thanks to social media, it just blasted these images out. Um, I, you know, as a journalist, I mean, even there's there, there's a lot of journalists based on the ground in Beirut, but it happened so quickly, so quickly, this explosion. That's not like a lot of people could have just gotten on the plane and come to report. You know, I had to rely, journalists from outside that, you know, we had to rely on the social media. I followed certain people, certain activists. Um, so these images were really important. I, I, I think that it's, and since we've all gotten so used to sharing images and you know communicating now through social media and Zoom because of coronavirus and the borders that have gone up due to lack of traveling, I think that's actually helped help the Lebanese cause. You know, I think it's I think social media as much as people you know sure there's its ups and downs, but it's it's a great vehicle if used properly to to help the people to change. Yeah. To, to raise awareness, you really, it's been really important for the raising of awareness, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to add something, if, if you allow it, about the whole diaspora thing. I think that the whole debate around social media is very relevant to the question of resilience, because I personally am from Beirut, and this whole thing has affected me a lot. I don't think we're resilient. I think it's more survival of the fittest. Because right now we're all in survival mode. We haven't been helped by the government or anything. So we either help each other or we die, basically, as morbid as that sounds. And which is why I think that uh, with the help of social media and the fact that we got international exposure for once, it was a way of keeping people alive. Because I don't think without the help and, and the, the funds of the diaspora, we could have gotten them back on our feet, to be fair. Yeah, no, I, I heard that a lot today. You know, we keep debating the word of resilience. I feel I struggle when I use it, but you're right. I, um, my friend Mariana Webbe, which I'm sure a lot of people follow her on social media. I'm sure you know her, but yeah, she was also saying at lunch today, is it, is it resilience? Maybe it's just survival mode. Um, art, arts are a way of survival. You know, when you're, when you're going through, look, even on a personal level, if you go through, uh, you know, someone dies, or you go through a bad breakup or divorce, you know, art is a way to channel that that pain sometimes so i remember an art teacher my mom's an artist actually but i remember an art teacher said sometimes the best art comes from times of pain i don't know you know you also create art when you're when you're really happy but you're you're right it's a survival as well um i know we're all struggling with the word resilience because the thing is resilience is also linked to abuse in this in this situation you know the lebanese people have been abused um in some ways i know it's it's hard to hear but so that's why um, yeah, I, I didn't, I totally understand. <laughs> um, so we have another question from Anonymous, which says, have you ever encountered ways in which art does not help in conflict resolution and instead pushes dangerous views? I think probably Wi-Fi issue. Yeah. <laughs> You guys, we have to bear with the Wi-Fi in Beirut. Yeah. It hasn't been good on good days. I don't even know what it's like right now. Yeah. Sorry, Rebecca. Did you hear? Did you hear what I asked? Or... Oh, I did. It says my internet connection is unstable. So. Oh. I hope... oh okay. 
Yeah, um, we'll say it again. Yeah, it's so Anonymous asks, have you ever encountered ways in which art does not help in conflict resolution and instead pushes dangerous views? Sure. Look, art is propagandistic. I mean, look at sort of, look at Hitler. Um, um, some of the sort of propaganda that took place even in Russia at the turn of the century. I mean, you find it in a lot of sort of political, um, you know, extreme sort of political groups, um, even in some ways the Ku Klux Klan or some of, the, some of the stuff that you're seeing is slogans, you know, ways of, again, propaganda. Um, I think when people see an image um, over and over and over again, that's imprinted in your mind, look at the, squ the swastika in some ways, you know, and that's still being used. So yes, art, 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 can, art can be positive, it can be negative. Um, but I think what's, what's not, what's undeniable is the power of the image, you know, the power of, of art, power of seeing that over and over and over and over and over again. Um, we, we forget, we forget how, how powerful that is. So yeah, I think that's what's, what's really important to note. I mean, it's happening in, you know, the US right now, um, America right now, we're going through a lot of, I mean, multitude of crises. There's a whole racism issue, which, you know, a lot of artists are talking about that through their work. So um, I do, I do think art can, can push dangerous views, um, particularly in a in a situation where the people are very weak and they need a leader and they need to follow someone. And so if you have a slogan that's, that's um, pushing a certain value that's propagandistic and it's trying to manipulate the people, then for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Gregory asks, as far as my limited knowledge goes, Lebanon is a rather stratified society troubled by inequality. Naturally, such crises as this explosion are hardest on the most disadvantaged. Would you say that art can also penetrate through class and wealth, acting as an egalitarian mechanism? In your experience, is it accessible to the average Lebanese? That's a great question, um, and it's you know, I, it's a great trust question, and it's a, it's the challenge right now because Lebanon is extremely, as you say, stratified, and it's and the inequalities are, are growing. You know, I went to the south yesterday to a, a village. Um, um, SOS Children's Village is an NGO there, and you know you pass by some extremely poor communities, um, and that's been the struggle. So it is true. I'm not going to deny um, that you know, in the hardest areas hit were where people could you know most prestigious, most expensive areas. I do believe that art can penetrate through class and wealth. That drawing that was created by that girl, she's an orphan. She's a refugee. Um, she's very young and. I think if you have the right means to go and to help to work with those people, to have them paint, to have them draw, that gives them the ability to express themselves. I can't say right now it's accessible to the average Lebanese, but no one's, because what? well, we're in a state, we're actually, we're in a crisis state, so museums aren't even open. I mean, right now, if you wanna to go to a show or a museum and see art, I mean, even for the average Lebanese, I mean, it's a little difficult at the moment, but no, it, it's not as readily available as it is for, um, it's the, it's a it's a it's it's also education, um, and that's why I believe I believe in this work actually with children. I think if you can if you can work with them at a young love at a young age and introduce them to that, I think it can really change. But um, and I do believe that art can penetrate through class and wealth. Um, I do. I think that's the basis of working with children through arts projects and giving them those means of education. I really believe in working at a young age. The whole gallery, um, you know, system. I mean, that's. Anyways, that's a whole nother that's a whole nother topic of conversation. But there are artists. There's um, Abdul Abdul Rahman Katanani, actually. He's someone you should you should um, look at. He's and his work is an art house right now. But he's a Palestinian refugee living in the he's living in the is it the Sabr Shatila refugee the he's living in one of the camps. But he creates incredible artwork, um, and he just creates it, you know. And he's actually exhibited and um, by Saleh Barakat Gallery, and his work is often using scraps of metal, found metal. Um, to create these sculptures, and it's collected by a lot of prominent Lebanese and international collectors. So I truly believe that art can penetrate through class and wealth, but you need people that can go through both sides and you can educate or you can bring art to the people who are disadvantaged. Um, you need more facilitators like that. You need people to go to children, you need them to go, and you need to offer them that opportunity. I think, I believe the world would be a better place, actually, if more people created art. I do. Um, and. But we need to find ways, I think, to 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 offer these portals. Um, I, I in in Ethiopia, for example, um, and I don't, 
yeah, I need to maybe interview these artists more, but you know, they, I went to the sort of community, they barely have any money. Um, and they don't even have many collectors, but all these artists are living together and they're creating their art. And it's one guy who's, he couldn't buy, or they couldn't get paintbrushes or something. So he's using spoons to create some, these installations and um, they just need to create. And, you know, so it's, the problem is, is that then to be, to make money off of it, because art, you know, they need to survive. You, you need to kind of be part and parcel of the system. Um, but I, I do believe that that it can, you know, break through these barriers. And I think it should more than ever now. Thanks. So could I just ask a couple more before we have a brief discussion in the members only Zoom room? Just a couple more. Um, the next one is from Henrique who asks, so far, have you noticed whether ex whether the explosion has led to any shifts in architectural style uh, as obviously the new buildings are being rebuilt now? Wow, that's I don't know if I'm I don't know if I've seen enough to answer this um, um, in a, with an expert lens because I've only seen a few things. But um, I wouldn't say there's new any architectural styles yet. I don't I don't think we can I, I don't know if I could I don't think we can determine new styles at the moment. It's a bit like when you're in a movement, you know, an art movement or an architectural movement. I mean, you you'll probably see the shift maybe next year. Yeah. I think you know, and even like, you know, this current pandemic, I think that there's a lot of art and stuff coming out, but we'll see it in a year or two, we'll be able to kind of talk about it more. But I definitely, I went to someone's home yesterday and, you know, he's moved to an upper level and he's moved around his furniture with the views and sort of readapted to, to a new living space that has also been, you know, rebuilt. Um, I don't think it's fostered new styles, but I think that people, he was so proud of his home. He was so proud to show his home. He owns a restaurant and, and he had put his art in, in a different corner. He had kind of readapted the design pieces that he has. So I think that, I think that's what's happening. Um, what I will, what I will, how I will answer that is there's a shift in materials being used in Lebanon. You know, I think right now in the absence of, um, you know, in this sort of dire economic climate, people are having to use different materials. Um, than they might have had access to before. Um, people are looking to use more natural materials that they, that they have more easier, you know, we're kind of moving to a more homegrown phase and, or upcycling. For example, Nada Debs is doing a lot of upcycling, um, which is still maintaining the luxury product, but using maybe lesser quality materials. So that's what's happening. And that's a response to our global situation, to the economic crisis in Lebanon, and to obviously the, you know, to the explosions as well. Thank you. Just one last question, and it's from Felicity. She asks, have you noticed any trends in the artistic response to Lebanon's crises, or to Lebanon's different crises? Um, I, need, I think I need to, um, I think I, it's, I'm sure there, there will be some trends. Um, I mean, I can't, I don't know if I can sort of, you know, yeah, particularly articulate specific trends, but people are using they're using damaged buildings, for example, to create art. Um, you know, Ab Abed Al Qadiri. I missed the show by two days. He used Gallery Tanit, where he was showing it was completely destroyed, to create an installation called "I Am a Tree," and so he used sort of the the damage, which I think is really interesting, sort of the carnage, um, as a basis to create an installation, um, to create an art, to create a painting. I mean, you could kind of argue a, a bit of a similar thing for Art House or uh you know you're kind of using this damaged well that's been rebuilt a bit and restructured um people are using i see you know material but they're they but lebanese have been doing doing that for a while i think that you know sometimes using sites of of carnage sites of mass destruction um as either inspiration or as a material in which to build upon an artwork but i think it's too i think it's too soon to say a trend um, what I can, what I, what I, what I think you can say is that, the, the, and I, I don't think there's any way to deny that is that after a moment, an explosion like this, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of depictions of destruction and using the destruction in artwork as a subject or using sites of destruction to place artworks in. Um, so I think that's, that's happening. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much. That was fantastic to get your opinion on what's going on. Um, thanks to everyone who uh, tuned in. And I think now the link for the um, 
members only Zoom room, and we'll have a little brief discussion maybe about Rebecca's earlier career, or how she got into what she's doing. Um, it's been posted in the chat, so if you uh, bought a ticket for that, you can click, go ahead and click on that. 